Tell me about London, your experiences in London. Well, that was tough because you, um, you, I came from, I was living in Vancouver at the time. I was, I just left. I was living in East Vancouver and on Skid Row. I was there for a while. And so I, I had work construction before that. So I brought this huge box of stuff and my art materials with me and I got a one way ticket and I, I showed up in London. And, uh, and your money is divided in half <laughs> right off the bat. You're like, you know, you're already hopping on one foot. And I was young and really, uh, hungry and had a lot of tenacity. So, um, I, we found a place to live and I started painting pretty right away. And I walked, I saw this hair salon in Covent Garden and there's this guy called uh, Greg Conrad. And I walked in and I said, I, I, I saw his place and I went back and I used the, we had a two bedroom, uh, one of those row houses. And I had a small studio with a washing machine in it and the water heater and everything. And, uh, I used that as my studio and uh, I cranked out a, a lot of paintings r quite quickly and I went to him and uh, he drove over the next day to um, from central London out to E13 and he bought three paintings and then he showed a, a whole bunch of his clients and he he's a hairdresser he knows a lot of people so then I ended up selling like 38 paintings in three and a half months. And uh, I was able to, you know, buy a table and chair and, you know, and, and just things were good. Things like it, it was, it was refreshing to, to go to a place where people really have a, an appreciation and they are, they're, they just have a cultivation or I don't know what you'd call it, just a sensitivity towards more culture and art. And they, they liked my work a lot. It was kind of new and refreshing. It was something that was a breath. It was kind of like opening a window. And so there was a lot of interest. People would uh, wait outside my, wait for me. I had a part-time job, I was 26. So I was working in on my lunch breaks I would go over and bring paintings and sell them uh, in 45 minutes and people, people would wait for me to get home and they'd be parked outside my house and I'd sell a whole bunch of paintings. What were you painting? Oh, I was just painting anything, whatever kind of, uh, initially I was kind of, I had these kind of ideas of music in my head and kind of musical scores and kind of layering and depth and uh, a nice fine kind of line and kind of like a composition on canvas, almost like, you know, uh, and then it, then I went into other things. Um, I started, was it, I started Willow World. I, I really missed um, this willow tree that was in my front yard in Richmond that I painted before I had left. And I just kind of missed nature so I started doing these abstract paintings called Willow World and things really took off from there. And then, then I started getting more absorbed into London. And so I started doing the study of the London Underground tube map in a kind of modern kind of way. And then the Prince of Morocco bought a painting and then everyone came to my house again and bought more art. And then, uh, and then won some competitions and things like that. And things kind of like, things were good, like, but it was hard. Like it's a tough city, right? Like you, you have to, like you're in London, it's like living in New York, the, your overhead and your cost is pretty tough. So, um, but I always wanted, I always kept myself hungry as an artist. I always thought that. It was best to do without 
and always be hungry if and that kind of creates uh you're out of your comfort zone of hunger like you wake up and you have to go eat so i always kind of position myself to had to have a dead end job so i'd always force myself to to be an artist was there a what was the point in time where you realized that you were an artist or you would become an artist I was in university first and I did two years of civil engineering and I did really well at that. Um, my marks were high, but I didn't love it. And I didn't know what I wanted to do and I had a lot of friction with my father and then he died of a heart attack when I was 21. Um, and I couldn't sleep at night. I was in residence on campus. So I had this small room and uh, everyone, I just had like insomnia in my brain. My heart was kind of always keeping my mind. And so I, I would paint from two o'clock till five o'clock in the morning because no one else was there. And I was always painting. And I, I, I resisted what I, the practicality of being an artist. I really kind of pushed it away for many years. For four years, I didn't want to do it, but I was painting 70, 80, 90 hours a week, every week. And then when I finished university, I, I kind of just, uh, I just, I didn't want anything. There wasn't, I didn't want anything in stores. I didn't want a car. I didn't want a house. There wasn't, but I, I loved, um, I was like a crackhead on paint, you know, <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. I just loved that, that just being completely in that calm of a tornado was, uh, was just such a beautiful, um, state of mind and being, and that was where I was at harmony. So that made a lot of sense for me. So I, I just, uh, decided, well, you know, if I'm going to do this, I better get good. So I started painting. I, I would leave my house like once a week and I was painting like 14 to 16 hours a week, every week for two years. So, and that was before I went to England. So I had condensed all of that, that time of getting, like getting, uh, learning what I was going to do. And how did you finance this uh, crack habit? <laughs> uh, people just, People found me. I found that um, it was just kind of um, an exchange. Somehow the energy that I was putting out into things just worked. You know, you jump out of a plane, you just keep falling and falling and I haven't really hit the ground yet. You know, I've hit a few branches along the way and hit my head pretty hard. Uh, but it's, it's, I guess there's, The way I look at it is that to share kind of an insight or something to someone who's wanting to be an artist is you have to kind of look at your life and design your life as to what you want and what you need and how to function. And I quickly realized that if you work one day a week, you don't pay any taxes on your pay stub. And if you work two days a week, you pay about 2%. And then when you work three or four days or five days, you start losing a lot of money. So I, I kind of figured out how to live off of two days a week of pay. Uh, and the rest was always coming in as painting sales. And then I slowly got rid of the two days. It's not so much being a crackhead or like wanting to constantly be this OCD obsessive artist. It's, I think the, the bigger question isn't, when did you decide to be an artist? It was kind of like, there's that fork in the road where you're like, do I want to be an artist or do I want to be a commercial artist? Do I want to be pure to the impulses and the expression and the growth and the complexity of what, how I see the world and how I'm ever changing and everything's in motion? Or do I want to be that kind of artist that it's like, I want to keep, um, like printing money, like, and painting the same thing and stamping the exact same mark all over and over and over again. And 
you know, there's this kind of, in the art world, there's a pressure, uh, a way to conform, or you, you go over and you do something and you get a pellet. So you keep repeating the same thing and then you build a box for yourself. And so every time that you go over and you shatter that box that was a system that financially worked for you and you go off and develop a new language or a new form of expression, then you, that's where things get difficult because, and that's kind of more challenge. I, I find people just, they find their glass slipper and they, they keep dancing in that one, to that same one note tune and that recipe of making art. So I've always kind of like, every day is a new day. Every day is a new expression. Every day is, um, I'm constantly trying something different. I'm always growing as an artist. I'm always in touch with, with the emotion or, or things that are happening in my life. And so that's kind of, uh, that has a, a consequence. Every, everything has an equal and opposite reaction, right? And that always impacts you. I've been painting for 30 years, so you, the challenge is constantly, there's kind of phases and challenges at each stage, you know. Um, you know, uh, people's expectation, the people who are close to you and who rely on you, like, they, you know, going uh, and paying for certain things like a volleyball or or driving a car that's really nice or having clothes or those types of things. Like there's all of these kind of, uh, people have expectations of you and, you know, uh, being called crazy, you know, and- And people called you crazy? Uh, who hasn't, <laughs> you know, honestly, like seriously, like, uh, you know, and to my face and uh, like, you know, it's, and I, I just like, I don't try to, um, I'm very comfortable with my decisions and with who I am and I don't really seek your approval. Like, so, but living kind of in that kind of um, autonomy or, or whatever you want to call it, um, that, that's difficult for those around you to, you know, I was, very, I was very lucky the first time I was truly loved for who I am was through meeting Tanya. I had never experienced someone who had really fully accepted and embraced me for exactly who I am. Uh, everyone else kind of really, whether they, they love me, they always wanted the best for me. And they, they brought their tools of life to think that they would fix me to the design of what they knew best. The white picket fence, the, the, the soccer mom weekends, you know, and all of those types of things. So I was, I received a double diagnosis of cancer. So I, I have all of this, uh, um, my lymphocytes all out of whack. That's my chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And then I also had a surgery here of, of melanoma. And so they ripped out, uh, the, the cancer there. And then they took out five, uh, things there. And, uh, that was, that's terrifying to know that you have a disease and, and still have a disease growing in your body. So this recent series, like, you just don't give a fuck. Like, you know, like you, you, uh, you go into the studio, um, kind of like a, like a bank robber, you have your ski mask, you have, you go in there with that intensity, like everything's got to go though, you know, and you just go in there and you just command everything. And it's, it's, it's exhausting. So you have this, you, you're faced with your own existential mortality and, 
and you have to wake up in the middle of the night and your brain's spinning out and you have to rest. <laughs> That's the only thing that can help you, but your mind's working overdrive. And so when I would go in the studio, I would just literally like, um, you know, owning an art supply store and having all these materials at your disposal, you just go in there like, you know, fry or tuck eating, like, you know, to a point of obesity. So I just started just piling the paint on as if I was gonna die every, like, that was gonna be my last painting. So I, I wasn't thinking about anything except just, uh, just enjoying that moment to the fullest. Is that series going to continue? I, I never know. I never, I, some series of paintings, um, eventually I, I'm trying to get away from it to get out of that headspace because it's really, uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I want to turn my, every day you get to decide how you view the world or things and I'm trying to look at things. That's why I went off and painted in Perth to paint and see the beauty of the world and focus my energy on, on not so much a fight, but more on healing. And talk about, describe, dis describe the differences between those two. Um, the process is one where you're literally like, you're, you're, you're just ripping your, your whole face and you're just like in there kind of like a, a UFC fight where you're just literally going into the absolute depth of facing death and which is amazing as an artist to be that intimately to waltz with those or slam dance with those thoughts in your mind. Um, so you just kind of peel yourself like a banana and you, you go in and you just move through that energy. And the other one is the, when you go out and paint in a landscape, you're, you're feeling the, the wind on your face. You're, you're looking at a tree, you're making an appointment with a, with listening to a bird. You're, feeling the the wet grass on your on your on your boots and you just have and what's in front of you is you're just kind of like uh interpreting and it's a lot easier you're just kind of you're having fun playing and it's so uh the other one is not uh you're not playing you're not you're it's completely a different um, you don't even, you don't, when you're in that state of, um, painting a malignant painting, you're, you're constantly kind of like responding and moving in such a way where you don't know where the finish line is. It's nothing's in front of you. It's all digging like Peter Gabriel, you're digging in the dirt of your mind and you've just, and you don't know where the, you don't know, you know, I've smashed a few paintings, I've had rage, I've cried, I've done everything in front of them, but they've been necessary. I like artists that are really kind of true to themselves, where they don't compromise. Um, so I, I, I go over and I look at someone like Eminem, I look at someone like, uh, uh, Sylvia Plath. I look at someone like uh, Farley Mowat. I look at someone like George Orwell. People, you know, um, Walt Whitman, Henry David Thor, Bob Dylan, like uh, Henry Moore, Francis Bacon, Van Gogh, William de Kooning, you know. Um, I find that they were kind of uncompromising and they were, uh, I just have a lot of respect for them. Cause I, I felt like 
they weren't afraid to to go to to talk like you you listen to a, a Bob Dylan song and the lyrics of it or you listen to an Eminem song or you a Francis Bacon or or anyone you know or Van Gogh they they just they you know um, they were true they're honest they they they're kind of naked in the rain of their their existence and so that's kind of gives you a um, a navigation as to a criteria of what um, where I like my artists to be where they're being true to their to their uh, their inspiration talk about community and and what you're actively doing to contribute to the strengthening of community community I I find that our society maybe I'm wrong at this but my perception is that so many things are you go to a hockey game you you pay for your seat you sit down you observe you go to a movie theater you observe you go there's you go to a restaurant you sit down you're not interact you're not put in a fishbowl where you're kind of bumping into to people and strangers and things where they're living authentically and having real conversations as much as we could you know the way the society is designed is so much driven on consumption and 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 consumerism and those kind of forces uh are in direct opposition as to what uh, brings happiness and what brings, you know, connection. Um, people stay in their in their their little communities, but they don't go off and and we live in such a diverse world, and we don't know the neighbor across the street from us. They might, you know, and so I. I do a lot of things to, and so does my wife, Tanya. She does heart and hand and she really, and I do the um, art of recovery for helping addicts. I, I help with uh, free art classes. I, I do the free art fair. I want to make art as accessible to the community and I want to just encourage it so that I, I sold like over 20,000 canvases at cost. I didn't make a dollar. <laughs> like it's a lot of canvas and that was in like less, that was in nine months. We were selling 2,000. And that was just to try to get, the motivation isn't about money. It's people always say, you know, um, or people don't say it. it's, I have enough. I, I, I I don't buy into this kind of uh, needing more. I, I, I think the thing I need more of in life is more kindness around me. And I need more people being happy. I need people being, and those are the things that I, I really put a lot of effort in and how I structure my business and my life. And and so does my wife, and so we have a great connection on that, and that's kind of a thread. Tell me about the foundry and what you've done to date and where you see it in the future. Well, I bought it and it, I had to remove uh, an absolute ton of, uh, of things out of it. I've been working on it for f almost five years now and remediating the site, uh, cutting down the structures, building the walls, uh, setting up a business during COVID, uh, jumping on my head like I'm on a pogo stick to, to adapt to all these regulations is not something I'm used to. So that's required a lot of growth on my part. Um, the general kind of long-term kind of view of it is that it will be something that's has a function in it in the community where it 
where it has art fairs, where there's art classes, where there's uh, all the artists that want to give art classes get space to offer those classes for free. Um, to have the cheapest prices in art materials anywhere. Um, and to make it so that people can express themselves using art and, and because I always find that that's a really po that's really positively helped me. So I want to share that with others. What are your, uh, what are your parameters for success? How do you define success for yourself personally? Tell me about some of your successes. Just being kind to other people. Just, uh, and being true to yourself, living your own personal truth. Um, sure, I have a lot of money and I've done well and I've, like, you know, bought this huge building and opened a business. And that's, you know, and I know that the optics of success of that are, but I, I've all, that hasn't really meant much to me. I, I've always been happy, you know, on just um, my successes that I get to go out and do what I want. And I always have, no matter what. If I had five bucks in my pocket or a hell of a lot more, I've always just done exactly what I wished. So if I feel like painting red, I paint red and I take as much paint as I can shove on a canvas. And arguably sometimes it might have been nice to go on a vacation <laughs> or buy a new car or do a painting that cost me several thousand dollars to do. But I've always just um, followed successes to be true to your own impulses and to be kind to others. Tell me the story about the lady who's coming to look at some of your paintings. Oh, uh, that one specifically or others. I've, I've had people uh, uh, who delayed buying a car for a year so they could buy my work. She got an extra painting, <laughs> you know. Uh, I've had, I've had people, I've had I sold a lot of paintings, so it's, you know, um, but people, the recent one is that, uh, someone was crying in front of one of my paintings was so moved by it. And so she, she has to get it. I've had people fly overseas to see my paintings and just to get them. Um, it's that kind of that story of, uh, for me, it's, that person, you know, uh, that lady who, who has nothing and Jesus goes over and she gives what penny she has or something. And then the rich people are like, oh, she gave nothing. But it, it's that it's an energy exchange. You, you know, an energy exchange. Mo my paintings are pretty off the wall. They're not your typical, they're, you're not buying one of them to to match your sofa or to, you know, you, you have to move things around quite a bit and you're going to be living with something, you know, uh, that's going to be, um, has a lot of energy, a lot of power or energy to it. So, um, I get people there, they need them. People, the, the people that they, they found the right homes. The people who needed my paintings found them. So I've been lucky that way. I've had kind of points when I was in England where people were blindly buying them because they were great investments, you know, but there's always an authenticity and, and people tap into that and, and it's required. Um, someone, saw one of my paintings and couldn't get it out of their head for four years and finally found me. That happens quite often. That happened uh, twice last year off the top of my head. What advice, you know, or direction would you give to somebody who knows that they can't change their spots, they are an artist, they're younger, what, what, how would you counsel them? I would say um, involvement, 
really contemplate the word involvement. If you really uh, are involved in your life and you're very deliberate with your with what you're doing and you're participating with your whole heart and soul, then you're winning. And if you're doing that, it's a leap of faith and things work out. But if your involvement is half ass, don't bother, you know, cause it's going to just going to be a, you're, you, you gotta go in for, you gotta, you gotta go up and swing like Babe Ruth. You gotta want to like hit it out of the park. And if you're not going to go out there and try to hit it out of the park and get your home run, you're not going to be memorable and no one's going to really pay attention to you because you're not respecting yourself enough for anyone else to really be inspired or motivated. Or you're going to end up doing crappy paintings on repeat a thousand times of the same bloody thing. Might as well go over and get a, like work in a, a box store or something. Do you have any, um... <laughs> <laughs> maybe cut that one out. <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to say something kind of, uh, so it's got a bit of punch for you. But... <laughs> yeah. Fuck it. You know, no, but just involvement. If you got to be involved in your life. And you really, the more involvement you have in your life and the way that you live your life, uh, that's, that's its own victory. That's its own uh, reward. And then the rest kind of, if you're satisfied with living it with that level of involvement, that the rest of the, the things are kind of details. What about like practical, like business, would you have any business advice? Not really, no. Just uh, make, like, put your time in. Yeah. Get good. Like, a lot of things is when you're first starting off is that people go over and they... To be an artist is to be a... Prof to be a professional artist is to, to... If you want to be respected like a doctor, if you want to be respected like a dentist, or you want to get paid like a lawyer, well, put in, put in eight years of hard work and, and investment into yourself, into your skills. And, and in one of the things is that so many artists at the beginning run around like a headless chicken wanting validation when they're pretty much wiping their ass on a canvas. Like they really do. They, 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 they create the crappiest technical shit that you can, you know, and they've, they come in and they, they want an exhibition or a show and they've done like 10 paintings in their lifetime, you know? Go do 2,000 paintings and don't seek any praise or any reward or anything. Go and do the work. And when you've actually sat there and put in like a doctor and gone to PhD level and you've you're actually skilled, and once you've got skill, then go out and start sharing what you have and don't waste your time and energy trying to make money when your painting is worth like a hundred bucks. Just give it away and get on with the next one and, and just m make more art to the point where you get good that you're, you don't have to work, that that's the focus. Get good at what you do and the rest kind of works out. Do you have any pieces that are either here or that you've sold or given away that were like were pivotal pieces or memorable to you or, or favorite a favorite? People artists get attached. People go over and get attached. Like you go over and you cr you sit there and I'll do like a, a malignant painting or I'll do a, a landscape painting and they're. I, I, I feel a, a, a mass of carthesis and I feel a, a, a pure connection with that moment of energy that I was channeling and, and managed to successfully, skillfully render that expression like, you know, like crucifying cross, Christ on it, you know, like it's a perfect moment of, of a symbol and everyone comes into my studio and picks that one out first and I'm always left with the seconds. And so you, you go over and like everyone always comes in and looks for like the freshest piece of fruit with no blemish. You know, it's 
we go into the grocery store and we're like, oh, well, this, this, this cherry sucks and this one's got a little bit of a mark on it. And that's kind of how you, people come into your studio and buy your art. And so you have to, as an artist, look at it more as, I love painting and I love the action of painting. So whatever I can do to keep painting, whatever I can do to gain more independence, freedom, and available options to live my life to the abundance of what I can, don't be attached. Yeah, I have certain paintings that I absolutely love, but I have a blank canvas in front of me that I want to work on. So I just, and I want to live authentically and I want to move towards that. And so I don't get hung up with those, you know, oh, how much should I price this painting for? When the right person that comes in your door and you know that they need it and they really, they need it, that's the right person to get it. I've sold paintings for 50 bucks. I've sold paintings for 30,000. I've done drawings that are incredible and I've given them to friends, you know? So it's, and their friendship meant more to me than that work of art.